Hello, I am Eric. This is the Long Box Review comic book podcast, and I am here today to talk about my comics history for March and April 1979. I only purchased three comics during March and April 1979, uh, the first of which is Battlestar Galactica number 4, which came out on March 13th. This is the Lost Gods of Cobol Part 1 Into the Void uh, issue. Uh, it has a great Walt Simonson and Klaus Janssen cover with, a, with uh, great-looking ships. It has a viper uh, in, the, in the, the, the center, front and center of the, of the uh, uh, cover, and it has some Cylon Raiders in the background, um, which is probably why I bought that particular issue because it just I love the ships of Battlestar Galactica and um, uh, I was a fan of the show Um, however I no longer have this issue and have no means to read it uh, to discuss it unfortunately Uh, but that's okay because the other two issues uh, I I, one I have and the other one I was able to read Uh, and and those are Justice League of America number 168 which came out on April 12th This tells part of a story that will have an infamous impact on the DC continuity 25 years later in in Identity Crisis. Um, I no longer have this issue in my collection um, and uh, really have no desire to have it in my collection. Um, Unlike this next one, which is Flash number 275, which also came out on April 12th, uh, which featured the death of Iris Allen. I had uh, gotten rid of this issue, you know, many, many, many years ago. Um, And then uh, within the last, I don't know, five years, I decided I wanted it back in my collection. So I I found a a copy and and, uh, was able to read that um, uh, in, you know, actually read the the comic book uh, for this particular episode. So... I decided that I'm going to start keeping count of my DC and Marvel uh, buying habits. And so far, uh, counting these issues that I have just mentioned, uh, these are the fourth and fifth DC comics that I had purchased by then, and my ninth Marvel comic purchased. So obviously that will change. Um, I'm not sure exactly when that changes, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's soon where I start buying a lot more DC comics. But uh, I'm going to keep track of that and until I decide I don't need to keep track of it anymore. But, you know, at this point, and I'm kind of surprised about it, I I uh, was buying more. I had been buying more Marvel comics. Given that the three comics that I started with were all Marvel comics, uh, and, you know, there, there was the amazing Spider-Man television show, Live action television show on at the time, Battlestar Galactica. Obviously, um, you know, obviously that's a licensed property, but Marvel had the rights to that. So, uh, yeah, it's interesting that um, I just find it interesting anyway. <laughs> I don't know if you do, but I do. All right. So, uh, one of the things that I do besides uh, looking at the comic books that I bought at that time, I also take a look at comics that I purchased later that came out at this time. And there are a few. Uh, In March, we had Marvel 2-in-1, number 52, which features uh, a a team-up between The Thing and Moon Knight. Uh, So I I bought that probably within the last year, year and a half. Um, This is the only issue of the 20 Marvel 2-in-1 title, 20 issues, uh, that I have that I haven't read yet. So it is a recent acquisition because, I, as I mentioned last time, I did do a uh, read through of all the Marvel two and one issues I had and uh, posted about them on the blog. Uh, so I need to get back in and read that one and see, see how it holds up, especially with one of my favorite Marvel characters in Moon Knight. Um, DC comics presents number 10 is another one, uh, which featured a team up of sorts with Superman and Sergeant rock. I actually purchased a copy of this later, a little bit later, in the Best of DC Digest number five, which wa- which featured featured the year's best comic stories. So it came out in 1979, but it was I'm sorry, it came out in 1980, 
but was uh, or featured stories that came out in 1979. And then I actually purchased the the issue, uh, the actual issue, my uh, for my collection sometime later. I honestly I was surprised when I looked it up in my comic um, da- uh, database and found that I actually had the issue. Although I probably should have checked the boxes to see if it actually is in there. But if it's in my database, I'm, I'm fairly certain I, <laughs> I have it. Another one is Detective Comics number 484. Uh, this is when it was a dollar comic anthology title. Uh, this one features Batgirl on the cover, distraught over uh, Commissioner Gordon's body, and she's telling Batman to back off because it's her case. I've not read that one. Another issue I haven't read yet, uh, another Superboy and the Legion of Superheroes. This is issue 252. Um, as shown in the cover, Dream Girl has dreamed that Superboy, Lightning Lad, and Wildfire all die fighting a character who, to me, somewhat looks like a uh, a 30th century version of Deadshot. Um, and that character is riding a flaming horse. So I, you know, um, given that, it uh, makes me really want to go read that issue. <laughs> In April, um, I got, uh, eventually got Daredevil number 159. Uh, Daredevil's being attacked by a guy with a knife as they fall into the water on the cover. I've not read it yet. Uh, uh, An issue that I have read is Adventure Comics number 464. Uh, This features Dead Men on the cover. Um, This is a part of Adventure Comics uh, run that I had. Uh, that I've gotten in the last, I don't know, several years, I'll say. But um, I had read through the anthology version. Well, I guess I guess all of the advent, most of the adventure comics I have are anthology. Anyway, they had multiple stories in in, in uh, the earlier run that I have, and Dead Man had uh, I don't know, it was a several part uh, story. But I recall that I didn't really care for the Dead Man stories in in, in adventure comics at that time. Another anthology title, Superman Family Number 196. Uh, just like I talked about with 195, I think it was, or for I, whichever one it was. This also featured Superboy on the cover, but this time he's sort of tap dancing on top of um, uh, helicopter blades that got loose from the helicopter, and they're they're heading for uh, the uh, Smallville citizens. <laughs> so I don't know. It's, it's really bizarre looking, but um, I've not read that one yet. And then another Superboy in the Legion of Superheroes, number 253. I have read this one. Um, this is the first part of the League of, As- of Super Assassins story. And the issue before my first Legion issue that I bought, 254. It's also Block's first appearance. And while I said I've read it, I, didn't, I did not read that first part until many, many, many years after I had bought 254. There you go. Those are the comics that I have purchased later that came out in March and April 1979. Some notable comics in some part, uh, notable to me anyway, that came out in March uh, 1979 is the Hembeck, the best of Dateline. Um, and then there's the, you know, the, the cute little symbol uh, indicating some swear word stuff. So it's Ampersand exclamation point, exclamation point, question mark, and pound sign. I think, uh, well, I'm not going to say what I think <laughs> What I think it's supposed to be, because uh, I try to keep it family friendly here. Anyway, this came out uh, from Eclipse Comics, and it's a collection of, of Hembeck strips that had been published back then in the Comics Buyer's Guide. It was actually something called something else before that, but then it was Comics Buyer's Guide, and then there was another website that, that Hembeck did this on. I had no idea this existed. I kind of want to get it. I'm just have to see if I can find a, um, a copy of this somewhere. Um, Crazy Magazine from Marvel reached issue 50. Uh, this features a Christopher Reeve-looking Superman trying to get into a phone booth to retrieve his Clark Kent clothes that are on the ground, while someone is inside the phone complaining to the operator about some crazy guy trying to get in. <laughs> I've never read an issue of Crazy, I don't think. Uh, Grimm's Ghost Stories from Gold Key also reached issue 50 in March 79, uh, and I looked that up, and it would end in another 10 issues. Never read. uh, I didn't even know that there was such a title called Grimm's Ghost Stories. So this is partly why I do this, because it's like all these comics that I 
w- uh, had no idea about. Um, where I was buying comics uh, back then were magazine or spinner racks in convenience stores, and they mostly had Marvel and DC, and that was it. So um, a lot of these I would never have known about. Uh, another milestone issue is Pep, number 350 from Archie. 350 issues uh, for a comic book title that started in 1940. Um, and there's no celebratory cover dressed. It's just another issue. 350. Um, and I think it would end in another, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I'm thinking, six, no, I don't know. I, I don't know. Never mind. <laughs> I looked it up, but now I don't remember what the how many it is. But um, anyway, and then uh, finally for March, the Warren Special Edition. And I've talked about Warren's um, magazines before. And so here we have another one. This is the J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings, um, uh, presumably a number one issue. It's a tie-in to Ralph Bakshi's The Lord of the Rings 1978 animated movie, which I have been wanting to rewatch for a while now. I really need to scratch that itch. Um, I saw it once, maybe in the theater. I think so. I have a vague recollection of seeing it in the theater. Uh, Although, who took me? Because it probably wasn't my mom or dad at that time. (laughs) Anyway, um, it uh, this this magazine uh, tie-in features several interviews and short articles, as well as re- a retelling of the story with artwork from the movie. And I kind of went down a little rabbit hole with that because uh, this that movie was supposed to be part one of two, I believe, and the um, uh, was it Universal or what, what whichever the studio was. They had no they they were they were really afraid to put part one on it because then they weren't sure people would go see a multi part movie serial. <laughs> so I don't know why, but uh, from what I've read, a lot of people who were fans of the Lord of the Rings were really disappointed that it ended. You know, it wasn't a a condensed version of the entire story it ended as as a part one and then we never got a part two why because not a lot of people went to see it and therefore um it was a self-fulfilling prophecy for the studio (laughs) so anyway in april uh first we have marvel spotlight number one so a relaunch of uh the that title uh because it was this is the second volume of it Uh, it features captain marvel on the cover And according to the Marvel Database Wiki, it contains a letter from Kurt Busiek and Scott McCloud. It was a co-signed letter from the two of them. And I really would like to know what they were writing about. Anyway, I I I I mean, this is, like I said, it's it's part of this Marvel Database Wiki. So how accurate is it? Anyway, if you have Marvel Spotlight number one, um, I would love to hear from you to know, uh, one, is the letter in there? And two, what were they writing about? All right, uh, next up is World of Krypton number one, which is, I guess, considered the first miniseries, uh, comic book miniseries from DC. Uh, uh, well, overall, but it, but it, obviously World of Krypton was from DC. Um, I actually have a vague recollection that I had this miniseries, or at least this first issue, but I, I can't, uh, <laughs> much like I, I mentioned, I think in the last episode, I can't. I can't uh, verify that uh, I actually had that one. Um, uh, a milestone issue here, Conan the Barbarian reached issue number 100 at that time. Uh, I have read very little Marvel Conan uh, stuff. X-Men number 123, which, which is the infamous arcade murder world issue. Uh, Ar- arcade had appeared in the previous issue at the end of the previous issue, but this is... And the story concludes next, the following in the in the following issue. But this is this is where um, Cyclops and uh, I think Colleen Wing are trapped in in Arcade's pinball murder pinball machine. I don't know. I I believe I have read that issue again. I uh, from probably Greg. Well, it, it it's it's either going to be Greg or Travis at this time. Uh, anyway, uh, I don't remember much about it, so maybe I should, uh, pull up the Marvel app and see if I can 
well, I'm sure it's there, but uh, uh, read that again after all these years. And then finally, uh, an- another number one, Battle of the Planets from Gold Key. Uh, never read it, um, but I do have very dim memories of watching the animated series, or at least some of them. So, but I, that was not one of those cartoon series, uh, uh, you know, imports from Japan that I got into. It was, for me, it was Star Blazers, and that was pretty much it. All right. So those are the notable comics from that time. If I've missed anything that, because, uh, you know, I don't, I don't look up all the issues that came out during those months. So uh, obviously, if there's something even more notable than, than the things I've mentioned, uh, let me know. I, I wouldn't mind coming back to that and, and talking about those. However, what I will do now is uh, talk more in depth about two of the issues that I bought at that time, and that is Justice League of America 168 and then Flash 275. All right, Justice League of America 168 by Dick Dillon, who did the cover, Jerry Conway, Frank McLaughlin, Jerry Serpy, and Ben Oda. Uh, this is titled The Last Great Switcheroo, and this is the very much abbreviated synopsis from the DC Database Wiki. The Secret Society's body switch is uncovered and reversed thanks to Zatanna. Yeah, so <laughs> I decided to fill in the gaps, give you a little bit more detail about this. Alrighty, the issue opens with Green Lantern, who has formed a green diamond around the Wizard, Blockbuster, Reverse Flash, and Plant Master. Meanwhile, Green Arrow doesn't like how joyful Superman and the others near near Superman are about capturing the secret society of supervillain members. He recaps for Hawkman, Black Canary Flash, and Elongated Man what happened before in the previous issue, how Superman called them there and told Green Arrow to use his shock arrow to capture the villains. Green Arrow says, quote, we won too easily. Both Elongated Man and Black Canary tell him he's being overly cynical. However, once Green Lantern is done, Superman throws the diamond into space, causing Green Arrow and the others to demand an explanation. Superman explains that he had discussed this plan with uh, with his group of uh, leaguer, Justice Leaguers before. Uh, Green Lantern put the villains into a time stasis, and he and Superman threw them into a solar orbit orbit until science can cure them of their villainous ways. Elongated Man seems okay with that, but Green Arrow thinks to himself that he now knows that Superman isn't who he appears to be. The Justice League leave. Overlooking, uh, leave the scene overlooking that one member of the villain group is lying unconscious on a nearby rooftop, and that is Star Sapphire. On the Justice League satellite, uh, Red Tornado breaks free from the icy prison that Star Sapphire encased him in, encased him in earlier. It's then that the transporter activates and Star, Saf- Star Sapphire appears. I wonder, since I'm having so much trouble saying Star Sapphire, I wonder if uh, the DC Comics characters also have that same problem. Um, Okay. Uh, Red Tornado goes to attack her, but holds back long enough for her to tell him that she is Zatanna. The Justice League arrives in Mexico City, and Superman verifies that the government has asked that they guard the Nova Jewels that are on display. Superman orders them into groups to patrol the museum. Green Arrow suspects that uh, Zatanna, if you can hear my my quotes around the name, is a phony too, while Elongated Man tells Hawkman that he found the way Zatanna talked about the Nova Jewels to be a bit suspicious, and Flash has a similar thought as he patrols with Batman and Wonder Woman. Black Canary and Green Lantern stay with the Jewels display, and then Green Lantern kisses Canary. Knowing instantly that Green Lantern isn't the real one, she attacks him and warns Green Arrow that and the other leaguers or that the that the other leaguers are imposters. Satana attacks Green Arrow, but he's ready and paralyzes her with an arrow so that she cannot use her spells. Batman and Wonder Woman attack Flash, but obviously he's too quick and traps them uh, with Wonder Woman's lasso. Uh, Superman sees the sequence of events while flying over the museum and decides to take care of the other leaguers himself, but he is stopped by a barrier, one created by the now free wizard. Red Tornado and the real, well, the Zatanna in Star Sapphire's body um, were able to retrieve and free all of their friends from the diamond prison cell. 
Zatanna, using Wither's power glove and the magical griffin statue, which uh, did the body swap uh, previously, puts everyone back in their own bodies. Green Arrow quizzes Superman to see if the transfer worked, and all are satisfied. And the issue ends. Okay, seeing all those villains I didn't know on the cover uh, facing the superheroes in, in those two lineups, uh, except for except for Zatanna, because I didn't know who that was, um, that's probably the why I bought this issue. You know, plus... Plus, you know, the it was just weird seeing them all handcuffed together and there's this glowy box thing in between them. It's like, well, wow, what's going on here? Uh, on page one, uh, I like the way the artist drew Green Lantern's face. It's very subtle, um, but he looks ticked as as he's um, starting to form that, that diamond prison. Uh, and then you couple that with the tendril-like gags over the villain's mouth. It's It's kind of creepy. Uh, the con- those the those two things in conjunction with each other, probably something I didn't really pay much attention to back in 1979. But looking on it now, it's like, ooh, that's that's really effective. Um, when Green Arrow starts grousing about his suspicions, he's telling Hawkman, and they agree with each other. Um, I don't know when their infamous disagreements began, uh, but I'm guessing it was before this point in Justice League uh, publishing history. So having them agree like this is kind of fascinating and maybe different. I don't know. You know, um, I have read very little Bronze Age Justice League of America. So, and and when I get into things like this, I'm like, I really need to go back and read that. I need to, you know, start at a certain point and just kind of read up through. And, and then I'm, you know, it's just, I have so many things to read. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, Wonder Woman, or actually Plant Master in Wonder Woman, tells Superman, actually the wizard, um, that Green Arrow has a naturally cynic- cynical mind. How does he know that? How does Plant Master know that about Green Arrow? Uh, were there many conflicts between them? Actual fights between Green Arrow and Plant Master where Plant Master knows or is there in this mind transfer thing is there any kind of and they don't show this but you know i'm speculating maybe there's some leakage <laughs> that's, that's kind of a gross word uh, considering um between the characters when they did the mind swap so that maybe wonder woman thinks that green arrow is naturally cynical and plant master is accessing that i don't know it's it's an odd uh detail to me um, I like the way the artists depict the reverse comet. That is the diamond prison that Superman hurdles sunward. Uh, the last panel on page five shows the prisoners having distressed faces, almost like we see the Kryptonian prisoners in Superman the movie as they are transported into the Phantom Zone and they float off into space. Um, so I don't know if that was intentional or not, but it, it it was pretty effective. I liked it. And in the in uh, in the convenient plot hole department everyone has forgotten that star sapphire is missing from the the group the captured group uh a caption box tells us that it's not a thousand feet away or she's not a thousand feet away from where they were and she doesn't appear to be hidden she's like out in the open on this rooftop so how did you know superman at the very least not know she was there or i it was weird like I said, convenient plot hole. Although I guess, you know, maybe something happened in the previous issue that accounts for this and I did not bother to check. <laughs> uh, I am intrigued by the Nova Jewels, the villains. Actually, they want to steal them. Uh, and though we're not told why exactly, uh, you know, fake Zatanna practically drools on the case, but does say that the jewels may be electronic components from a crashed alien vessel from 10,000 years ago. And I had wondered if perhaps someone else had picked up on this idea uh, and and developed a story around it or, you know, the aliens come back. I don't know, whatever. But the DC database wiki says that this is the jewels only appearance. So, you know, I guess, you know, get on that, Tom King. <laughs> uh, another convenience, uh, reverse flash in Green Lantern's body assaulting Black Canary. Uh, if not for that event, the villains may have succeeded in their plan, or at least partially. Uh, I'm sure Ollie would have been uh, able to stave them off until help arrived. 
uh, if if they had gone that way. But it did make me think: did did Reverse Flash have a thing for Black Canary any at any point, and that's why he just grabs her and kisses her? Uh, it was, <laughs> yeah. Some of this, some of this this older stuff that I'm getting into is just filled with really cringy type stuff. Uh, and then finally, the final page ignores the elephant in the room, one even I, at the ripe old age of 10, uh, thought of. Why weren't the superheroes concerned about the villains knowing who they were or knowing anything about them or their loved ones, you know, it's, or whatever? Wasn't there, was there not just not enough time? Uh, Red Tornado does state, after he breaks free from his icy prison, that he was attacked perhaps an hour ago. But, you know, surely that's still enough time to unmask Batman at the very least and see that it's Bruce Wayne, right? Because most of the characters that were, whose bodies were swapped uh, were, were wearing masks, I think. Although, you know, Green Arrow or Green Lantern's mask is not, not much of one. Anyway, so, yeah, it's just it was. It was it was a bit odd. Uh, but, you know, it was enough of a nagging thought that I think Brad Meltzer used it later. So, uh, and it still bugs me after all these years that Conway wanted to sweep everything real about this encounter like that under the rug with a wink and a literal smile from Superman and his terrible joke about someone. Does someone have the key for the handcuffs? <laughs> oh, my God. It, it reminded me of those. Um, sometimes humorous endings, um, uh, from Star Trek where, you know, they got, they, they'd make a comment and suddenly they'd start laughing on the bridge. It's just, it's just so hokey. Anyway, it was, it was still fun to revisit this, uh, this old chestnut. Like I said, it, it you know, I bought this, it's the second part of a three part story and I never read or I did not read the first or third part until many, many years later. So. Now that, that's how comics were for for me back then. It's like, well, I got this and just have to go with it. And I may not know what's happened before and I may not know what happened next. Um, so I just enjoyed uh, enjoyed it as I could. Um, and this is a similar situation with Flash 275, which is, you know, kind of a milestone-ish thing. Anyway, uh, that's not what I'm here to talk about. I'm here to talk about this particular issue, which is by Alex Savick. Carrie Bates, Frank uh, Chiaramonti, Jean D'Angelo, Todd Klein, uh, with a cover by Dick Giordano and Tatiana Wood on the colors. Uh, this is called The Last Dance. Oh, it's interesting that both these issues, issue titles start with The Last. Anyway, uh, the synopsis from the DC Database Wiki is the following. Barry Allen and Iris Allen go to a masquerade party, unwittingly taking Clive Yorkin along with them. And during the party, Barry is drugged into unconsciousness and Iris is killed. Okay, a little better than JLA 168, but still a bit lacking. So I want to give you the following synopsis. Flash is drawn by ESP to meet a young woman in a motel room while a man lurks outside the Allen's home watching Iris. It turns out to be Clive Yorkin, a criminally, a criminal driven insane by the nephron process performed on him in issue 270. The young woman controlling Flash is Melanie, who helped track down Yorkin in the earlier issue and is now fixated on our hero. She makes him remove his mask, but instead of liking what she sees, she sees, she calls him ordinary and storms out. As Melanie rides away on her motorcycle, Iris arrives at the same motel having placed a tracer uh, on Flash's uh, uh, ring because she suspected some infidelity. While Barry is contemplating his ordinary face in a mirror, Iris bursts in, realizing what she suspected was true, runs out of the room, and speeds off in her car. She's so distraught that she crashes into a semi-truck. Flash saves her by vibrating her through the car windshield, and they talk about what Iris thought she knew. When they arrive home, Flash tells her he thinks it's time they had a baby. Iris responds, quote, You must have read my mind. Before they can start that process, however, Barry spies a package from a costume shop for the masquerade party they were supposed to attend that night. Iris suggests that Barry go as the Flash because no one would, would suspect him since he's so, quote, ordinary looking. Barry removes his mask in front of a window that Yorkin is watching, 
Uh, and Yorkin recognizes Barry as an observer of the Nephron experiment and someone who let the agonizing process go on and on. Central City cop Frank Curtis, who has who helped the Flash uh, earlier, arrives to pick up the Allens, and he too is dressed as the Flash, while Iris wears a Batgirl costume. Uh, side note: Barry was supposed to go as Batman, but he never got back to the costume shop to get a different outfit because they had been sold out of that one. And hence uh, Iris's um, uh, suggestion to go as the Flash. Once at the Whitlock Mansion, they go inside, unaware that Yorkin has stowed away in Curtis's trunk. Once inside, Barry and Iris start dancing, but are interrupted when Barry gets a phone call from his boss, Chief Paulson. Outside, Curtis is, a, is having a smoke when Yorkin attacks him, rips off Curtis's mask, and then throws Curtis's body over the balcony once he realizes that he isn't Barry. On his way back from the phone call, Barry gets a couple drinks and heads back to the dance floor to find Iris dancing with a man dressed as Green Lantern. Only it turns out to be, actually be Hal Jordan who stopped by just to see what costume Barry chose. He congratulates his friend on the baby news and then flies off. The couple toast themselves and their future child and decide to explore the mansion. As Barry starts up some stairs, he feels woozy and sits down, while Iris goes to get him some water. A moment later, Barry hears some crashing noises in a, near- in a nearby room and hears his wife crying out for him. He finds Iris on the floor with Yorkin standing over her. Yorkin then jumps out of out the window. Uh, Barry tries to lift Iris, telling those who just arrived she needs a doctor, and then he falls to the floor. Curtis arrives, asking how they are, and a man dressed as Batman announces that one of them is dead. I am fairly certain, like 99.999% certain, that the cover is what caused me to buy this issue. Uh, Flash and Batgirl is dancing together? Uh, Superman, actually, it's, it's, um, it's, it's bizarro, but I didn't think that at the time. I thought it was a Superman, uh, is being killed in a grotesque way by a guy in a gas mask. Uh, of course, Flash does announce it's a masquerade party on the cover. So who is everyone here? I wasn't as, as familiar with the DC universe at that time. Uh, and then there's the, the invitation card at the bottom telling us we are cordially invited to attend the last dance and witness the death of... And then the name is covered by a thumb holding the card. Um, this is my first Dick Giordano cover, and he would be an artist whose style I would start to recognize as I as I went on. Uh, and I still love Giordano's artwork. Besides Flash and Batgirl in the center of the cover, there's the Golden Age Sandman, which is the the uh, gas mask guy, um, whom I would discover later. And of course, Bizarro, as I mentioned. Uh, it's possible I did, uh, maybe from the Superman's car, uh, super friends cartoon, but yeah, I, I, you know, if you're not paying attention, it just looks like, uh, it looks like Superman or someone dressed as Superman, uh, is, um, dying. He's got uh, his, his, his skin is gray and he's got these cracks on his face, uh, almost like he's drying up. Uh, but, but it does show the backwards S so which actually that character does not appear as far as I could tell in the issue. Anyway, uh, in the background of the cover, dancing are... Okay, this... this I put this out on social media yesterday as I record this uh, because there is a woman who's wearing this style of mask and I can't quite place it. I am going to guess it's Nightshade. Um, other people guess that it was Huntress which I don't think so because of the way the mask is shaped. Another person uh, suggested that it was a, another Star Sapphire character because there, th- th- there's another one that appears here. I'll just I'll mention that in a second. I don't think so. Again, the masks are similar, but they are different. And I don't see the headgear that Star Sapphire wears in this particular character. So I think it's Nightshade. But I, I'm not certain. It doesn't quite. The color doesn't quite match. So I don't know. So if you know, I would love to hear from you. <laughs> uh, let's see. So like I said, Nightshade is dancing with uh, an Aquaman, uh, Black Canary, and Green Arrow are together dancing. Captain Cold is standing there. He might be dancing with someone. The way his arms are shown, but we don't just get to see his partner because it's covered up by someone in the foreground. And then finally, a Reverse Flash and Star Sapphire uh, character. Uh, a person 
uh, dancing together. So, you know, it's like all these characters, like some of them I knew, a few of them I knew, most of them I didn't at that time. So, and then the whole idea of, of, uh, you know, someone dying in the issue, it's like, that was, this was my first flash issue that I ever bought, ever read. So it's like, it wasn't like I knew a whole lot. I knew of the character from the super friends cartoon and that is it. Anyway, uh, the whole Melanie thing, um, reading it now really plays out kind of like a porn fantasy. (laughs) So it's like so bizarre. And, you know, I think she's supposed to be like, at most she's 18, but I think she's actually underage. I don't know. I, I'd have to go back and read those other stories previous to this. But but back then, I think I was just confused. Um, I knew what ESP was even then, but I didn't think it included mind control. And she clearly can control Barry's mind to the degree that she compels him from a distance to come running to her and then forces him to take off his mask. So it makes me want to know, um, did this character ever appear again? Uh, What, you know, what happened with her? Cause she's clearly on a bizarre path and she has these weird fixations. Uh, Let's see. Um, her her rejection of Flash after the, after the demasking was kind of funny, I guess. It reminds me of how Black Cat reacted when she saw Peter's face. Uh, artists uh, Savick and Chiaramonte do a good a great job actually of showing uh, in one panel Barry's astonished and perturbed reaction when she announces what a letdown he is. <laughs> so, um, and then she also is like first. Um, First John Travolta and now The Flash. So it's like, wow, what did she do with John Travolta? Uh, I still feel like uh, Iris's turnaround was too quick um, once Flash starts to tell her what happened. You know, at first she's like, oh, come on, Barry. And then she's like, oh, oh, but your disappointment in being called ordinary is 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 so true. So it must be what you're telling me must be true. Oh, boy. Such as comics. <laughs> and soap operas. Um, and then for them to immediately transition to, oh, we should have a baby. Let's have a baby. I I, I think they should seek some marriage counseling before they jump into that. But uh, anyway, that's not to be. <laughs> um, I kind of, uh, I think it's kind of funny how uh, now, how uh, or that Barry was going to go to the masquerade party as Batman, given the detective slash police scientist angle that has been played up in more recent DC comics that I've read. But going together as Batman and Batgirl, it's kind of ew. (laughs) Uh, You know, no, of course, the age difference in relationship, even though, oh my God, they've played with that in at least one animated movie, Batman animated movie. Uh, So, you know, uh, but, you know, in continuity, um, do the Allens think that those two have a thing going? Does the general DC populace think that Batman and Batgirl are a thing? I don't know. It's just kind of fun to think about in that way. When they walk into the party room at the mansion, we see a bunch more costume folk, including uh, starting clockwise or clockwise going around the room, starting on the left side of the page. We've got a Wonder Woman, a Batman, Golden Glider, Captain Cold, Black Canary, Green Arrow, a brown haired Aquaman. I believe he's blonde on the cover. Anyway, uh, Captain Boomerang. And then we have the Phantom in the background, which I thought was kind of fun. I believe it's the calculator, hot girl. There's an, an I can't identify this woman. Uh, it's a nondescript woman. You, I only, you kind of only see her head. I don't know who she is. Heat wave, the top, Zatanna, Green Lantern. And okay, this one I'm not sure about. It's either Zatara or maybe Abracadabra. I think maybe it's more supposed to be Abracadabra. Uh, based on the way the the guy's head's lo- head head looks and the pencil thin mustache, uh, a uh, speaking of mustache, a mustachioed Superman uh, also wearing glasses, Mirror Master, another Black Canary, another Green Lantern, which I think is Hal, in this case, Star Sapphire, Reverse Flash, and the Golden Age Sandman, and so I'm guessing because you know this is the Earth Two character. Uh, that this person also read the Flash comic books that Barry did and therefore knows about uh, or dressed, you know, cosplayed as a character from a comic book instead of what everybody else is doing, which is 
all real characters within the DC universe. So anyway, I thought that was kind of neat. Um, in later scenes, we also see a Poison Ivy, Pied Piper, and then Supergirl, uh, who is the person who gives Barry his drinks. And I thought Savick does a, a really great job at keeping with the characters he shows at first and not just uh, randomly uh, tossing in costume characters in later panels that we haven't seen already, for the most part. So I that's one of those things that I, I, I appreciate when we get, you know, uh, uh, scenes like this where we got multiple people dressed as this or, you know, characters that are just there in a scene and then we see other characters that we didn't see in like the group shot, for example, right? So I, I appreciate the continuity there. Uh, it seems highly suspicious of whomever is wearing the Sandman costume because he keeps pointing his gun at people and saying, Zap! I got you! Um, he does it three times in the story, but it appears to be a red herring because Flash then sees Yorkin standing over Iris's body and then Yorkin flees instead of attacking him, which is what he intended to do. After all... Uh, Yorkin assaults Curtis, who also Curtis himself isn't shown. So after that incident, he's not shown trying to find the guy that tossed him over the balcony. Uh, so, you know, maybe and this is me thinking, you know, trying to think back then what maybe I thought about <laughs> this issue and solving the mystery of who killed Iris. So maybe there's something going on with Curtis. I don't know, because there is a scene earlier and I didn't mention this in the synopsis, but there's a two panel scene where this guy's talking on the phone and it's clearly essentially uh he wants he wants Barry Allen dead so who's this guy and like i said maybe curtis is involved anyway so yeah uh i suspected him or was trying to retroactively suspect him <laughs> uh, uh i thought it was cute that the real green lantern was there um you know, drawn by Savick from uh, who drew Green Lantern 111, 112, which I discussed previously. And so it was a nice another another bit of continuity there. Um, I did not check now that now that I'm now that I'm talking about it. I did not check to see if Savick uh, had been drawing the flash up to this point. So anyway, uh, this issue was considered a pivotal point in DC Comics history and would forever alter Barry's life until his death in crisis. And I heard uh, that take this with a grain of salt because I'm hearing it, you know, second, third, whatever hand that, uh, apparently Alex Ross doesn't consider anything after this event to be his headcanon, uh, DC universe. And, uh, it was pointed out that his, all his depictions of the justice league are the satellite era before this event for the most part, I believe. Uh, it's so strange to think I randomly picked up this issue back then and didn't think of, of it as an, as important as it became. And I guess, you know, I could probably say that about a lot of comics that I ended up getting around this time, but we shall see, I suppose. And then finally, uh, in the Ask the Answer Man column in the DC Planet Extra page, Bob Rosakis is asked how many people work in the DC offices at 75 Rockefeller Plaza. And the answer is about 25. I just, that was just a weird bit of trivia that I appreciated. I don't know why. He does make a point of, of saying that like all the artists and writers and stuff are, uh, you know, don't don't actually work in the office. So. All right. That is my comics history for March and April 1979. Uh, if you have any questions or comments about any of these comic books that I have mentioned or information, like I said, uh, about any of those things that I wasn't sure about, please let me know. You can email me at longboxreview at gmail.com or leave comments at longboxreview.com or on social media. Social media, And don't forget, uh, you can also uh, call in, in, or text, uh, and leave a message for me at 208-953-1841 if you uh, would like to leave a voicemail. I would love to play those on the show. And um, thanks for listening. I will talk to you later. Bye-bye.